Welcome back to the Richard and Judy Book Club in partnership with W.H. Smith. Today we're talking about The Blasphemer by journalist uh, Nigel Farndale. Uh, hmm, poses some fascinating questions, this book. As a man, have you ever considered this? What would you do if you were in the trenches, in the front line somewhere, as a conscripted soldier, not a professional, and was ordered to go over the top? Could you? Could you follow through? Let's come to the present day. What if you were sitting next to your beloved on an airliner or an airplane that crashed and you survived, both of you, would you put her life first, his life first, or yourself first? And those are the dilemmas that face some of the central characters in this wonderful book. Uh, I won't reveal too much of what happens, although it does on the, on the back flap say that, uh, that one of the central characters does choose himself over his loved one, only to change his mind once he's out of the wreckage and comes back. It's, it, these are fascinating dilemmas. What made you use them as the starting point of the blasphemer, Nigel? Well, I, I, I've always been intrigued by the, the question of what you would do in those circumstances mm. if you were tested as, as a man. And there aren't that many scenarios in which you would be for our generation. For previous generations, there, was, there were wars where mm. men would be tested and have split-second decisions and either prove themselves brave or prove themselves cowardly. And the, the actual scenario that, that the, the book opens with of the, the, the husband or what the, the husband to be, the fiance, common, yeah. common law <coughs> man and wife, mm. uh, where he, in a moment of panic, scrambles over his, his common law wife, the woman he loves, anyway. Uh, he, he doesn't have a conscious decision behind that. It's absolute sort of animal instinct mm. for self preservation. And it's only when he gets to the surface and realizes what, he'd done, what he's done, he comes back and rescues her. And I've I suppose the, it, the, it, was, it was empathy that drew me to that uh, situation, wondering what, what I would do, and not really knowing, because none of us do know. Until the moment. Until the moment. Mm. Um, I remember uh, asking um, Clive James, uh, it just came up in conversation, whether he felt he would have been capable of, of putting his own life before uh, th that of his daughters, whether, whether he could sacrifice himself for his daughters. And he gave the only honest answer a man can give, which is, I hope so, mm. but I just don't know. Mm. There are so many themes tackled in, in The Blasphemer. The title is very, very relevant because basically the hero of the book, if you like, or the hero of most of the book, because there are two separate stories running in parallel here, is um, a scientist, Daniel, who is totally, a total atheist, has no belief, total rational, Dawkins supporter has no belief whatsoever in God and yet he is faced with by what happens initially by the, what happens during this plane crash and then later on uh, in life he's faced with the fact that there's some inexplicable force in his life which seems to keep recurring and, and, and saves his life again and again and again. Now it's very very subtle and it's hard to put a religious connotation on it but are you saying that basically we all have to accept that there are inexplicable things in our lives which affect our fates and save us. Um, no, I'm, I'm not sure that there, there are. Um, but I was intrigued with the, the idea of exploring mm. what would happen to an atheist who believed that there couldn't be. Mm. Mm. So it's more his, <coughs> his complete conviction that, uh, that there, were, there were no outside influences. Um, and this is partly prompted by uh, an encounter I had with Richard Dawkins, uh, where, where I interviewed him, and, and was very impressed by his fluency and his conviction. And, and I asked him to uh, explain altruism in, in the context of the selfish gene. I mean, it just doesn't seem to make any sense, because mm. all your selfish instincts are to, to save yourself, and, mm. and to actually save others seems, seems very con contrary to that. And he sort of gave a, a mildly com compelling answer to that, but I came away unconvinced, and, and then I started to wonder what someone like him, who was so convinced of their atheism, what they would actually do if they confronted something which they couldn't explain, mm. just, kept, just <coughs> kept out of reach of their scientific in inquiry. Right. Uh, it's so not, it's not, but it's not just a, a philosophical book, it's a damn good story. It flips <coughs> constantly from uh, the trenches in the build-up of the Battle of uh, Passchendaele, uh, which was utter slaughter, uh, where, of course, um, the, the, the character's great-grandfather, Andrew, Andrew is, is about to go into action. You write brilliantly about, about uh, trench life 
uh, not just the battles, but, but the day-to-day -day grinding nature of that. And also, beautifully, about the, uh, the way that the war would brutalize sensitive men. There's, a, there, there's an officer in this who is a, a composer and a conductor and is um, uh, in love with classical music. But he is one of the most brutal characters in the book, and he's been made so by the war. Mm. Was that entirely from your imagination, or did you do a lot of research into the psychology of what happened to men in the trenches? Well, I, I did do a lot of research, and, and the, there was a certain type, particularly among the officers, of, of people who'd had incredibly sort of Elegant. distinguished mm. educations, and uh, there were some of the most brutal men, in a funny sort of way, were the, were the chaplains, because they, they got to see so much uh, gore, gore. And, and the human nature at its worst that they became quite sort of callous in, in the way that they their attitudes to, to what was going on and their hatred of the Germans. There was a bishop who gave a, a sermon which was absolutely blood curdling and saying you've got to kill more Germans and, and this seemed a very sort of unchristian message. But they, it did it did brutalize men and, and me, particularly men of a, a very sensitive nature and, and and the Second World War did that of course as well in, mm. in, in more dramatic terms because so many of the the, the Nazi uh, those who were most genocidal mm. Were, were also those who were most civilised and, and university cultured. educated. Yeah, mm. but 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 uh, you, you dedicate the book to your own grandfather. He fought in the trenches. Um, did he? Did you talk to him much about what happened to him? Did, did you did you get anything for your book from him? I, I did talk to him a lot because I, I knew him very well because he was he was ninety when he died, mm. and I sort of grew up listening to his stories and being mesmerised by mm. his accounts of what happened in Passchendaele, and it did scar him for life. Really, he he was. Um, he, he was prone to mood swings, and, mm. and we, we all knew that when he would go quiet for sometimes for weeks on end, it mm. was it was because of the, the terrible things he'd witnessed during Passchendaele, which he managed to somehow survive. Mm. Um, but it, it was uh, yes, uh, the, the actual dedication is mm. is that he he sort of died twice, yes. once on in Passchendaele and once, once in his, his bed seventy years later. Because <coughs> I think a lot of those who fought at Passchendaele did. Die. That there's a Siegfried Sassoon poem that um, I died in hell. They called yes. it Passion Day. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to raise this question of the guardian angel, which um, pops up at several points during the book. Never explicitly. Never ex well. In fact, you, you, well, you, you, you may tell us that there isn't a guardian you angel. You never know. Book. You never know <clears throat> what it is, but there is some inexplicable Presence. spiritual thing happening. Um, I love the idea of what you say about imagining Richard Dawkins to kind of be <laughs> in that position. Did you sort of think Daniel was kind of a, a younger Richard Dawkins <laughs> when you were writing it? I, th I think I did, yes. <laughs> I, 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 li I liked his sort of very sort of literal mindedness and his, yeah. uh, just, just his, his approach to the world. Um, yes, I suppose, d d what, wh whether I think there was a guardian angel, I'm, I'm not sure. I think I, I like the ambiguity about yes. it, mm. even yeah. to myself, you know, yeah. because, I mean, from, from the point of view of the character, Daniel, he, he is certain that he can explain it away, and he, and he thinks he's found a, a logical explanation, right, which is in finding the yeah teacher. temporal lobe epilepsy mm. can produce vision. Yeah, hallucination. And, yeah, yeah and, and he's convinced it's a hallucination, but uh, whether it is or it isn't, sort of mm. is, is one of the I love that spiritual ideas I play with It's lovely. Throughout. Well, yeah. Nigel, it's a real achievement. It's a wonderful read. Every page. Say so we've been discussing uh, the, the spiritual aspects of it, but it's just a damn good rattling yarn. It really is beautifully written. Thank you. I can tell you're a journalist. Thank you very much. It has a real logic to it. So that's The Blasphemer by Nigel Farndale, a fine book. Um, do go to this website when you've read it and post your review or views, your blog, whatever you want to do. We love hearing from you. It's whsmith.co.uk forward slash Richard and Judy. Happy reading.